Hello, everybody. This week's episode is about madness. Madness is a cultural thing, and it's an illness where you just go mad. When madness is something that culture is interested in, what's the point of it? Well, it's a route to another world. It's a continent to be explored. It's part of the romantic quest to go out there. In this case, really out there. Only out there is in here, the infinite space of the mind. This whole program comes from the Madhouse. The first part is about mad artists. Since Romanticism, there's been a tradition of artists being slightly mad anyway. It's because they have a special type of imagination. From that romantic idea, we also have the tradition of the really mad artist, whose raw vision of how the world is, untethered by convention, is always a bit unacceptable to the world in the artist's own lifetime. Van Gogh is the most famous mad artist that we think of, the most abiding model of that idea. I think he is a quite fantastic artist, but that's because he's not a typically mad one. There are always exhibitions and books coming out devoted to the art of the insane. It always looks quite similar, quite repetitive, obsessive, filled up, very detailed. Van Gogh's paintings, on the other hand, are marvels of sophisticated colour and a composed, rational, very spatial look, as well as the characteristic Van Gogh mark-making. Art history flows through them. Japanese wood prints, impressionism, modernistic flatness, assertion of the surface and its division into flat decorative shapes, like the uh, shape of the starry night sky in his Night Cafe of 1888. Even the subject matter, modern, everyday life, immediate reality, is part of respectable, unmad art history. Mad art, on the other hand, is always outside of history. It doesn't relate to that. That's the point of it. It doesn't matter what year it was done. And yet, you can't really take the madness out of Van Gogh. And it's right that he should be the poster boy for art as well as for lunatics. When people go to the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, they expect to find greatness. They don't care if it's Impressionism or Expressionism, and they're right. Why be pedantic? On the other hand, they've got a lot of clichés in their heads about Van Gogh. One is that he was mad and he cut off his ear. They think, that's intense. They see his swirling paint. They think the same kind of intensity must be in there somewhere. In fact, Van Gogh's art has a very knowing side. He studied Japanese prints, and he learned colour theories from the Impressionists. This is his painting of a house he lived in, in Arles in Provence, where he hoped to set up an artist's commune. For a mad outsider, Van Gogh was very conscious of the social world. He wanted his art to be connected to life, to people's ordinary working existence, and he wanted it to be excellent. He planned out the colours for this painting of his bedroom in Arles absolutely rationally. He wrote about them in a letter, listing every one from violet to lilac, from lime green to scarlet. Ten years ago, one of Van Gogh's paintings sold for $82 million, the highest price ever paid for a painting. It's part of the idea of Van Gogh's Christ-like suffering that society didn't want him when he was alive, and now inflated prices are paid for him by junk bond guys and bankers for investment. It's a complicated mix-up, the Van Gogh myth. Art must be disturbing because that's what a genius is, and geniuses must be mad. Why? Like the Beatles fall on the hill, the mad artist sees the world going round, but in a more clear way than anybody else. Van Gogh is the star of the mad art myth, but there's a whole supporting cast of crazes and doctors, artists and audiences, and with them, a whole set of cultural ideas, many of which are a bit mad themselves. I'm in a real asylum now for schizophrenics. The walls here are covered in art by the patients. It's all pretty nice, kind of charming. It's a special wing of the Gugging Asylum just outside Vienna. Hello. The wing is called Hi. the House of the Artists. Florian. Florian, hello. Will you show me around? Yes, I can. 
The ten patients in this wing have got long histories of being in institutions, but they can only be sent here if they have some kind of artistic talent. This, um, Hello. This one, Oswald Chertner, who is 81, is the creator of images for the record covers of a heavy German industrial rock band. He doesn't know his stretched fantasy man drawings have been used for that. They're just something he needs to do every day. This is August Waller. He's 65. Hi. Hello, August. He's filled up Matthew. every inch of wall space in his bedroom with his signs and words and weird hieroglyphs. I like his stuff the best. The House of Artists was founded by Viennese psychiatrist Leo Navratil working with schizophrenic patients in the 1950s. Navratil believed his psychotic patients tried to restore a symbolic order to the world by externalizing and channeling their drives through art. He encouraged them to make art. Hello there. Hi. Are you? Very, very well. The art looks like it doesn't care about art history or about art galleries. It looks untrained and naive, but it can look great. This thing is ah, this drawing is great. Yeah, very, very nice, all the things going on there. Their art isn't about conforming to whatever is new and clever in the art world, or to the grandness of art history. It's as if someone has said, let's strip away all that, and go for something that's simply self-expression instead. And here's a um, skull, uh, a star. Compass, this is compass. A compass, compass. yeah, compass. yeah, yeah. I mean, this is ha has a very different content. Flowers and man, yeah, yeah. yeah. All the things in the room have a nice placement everywhere, <laughs> like the things within the pictures. Yeah. An artist needs to look for um, having everything in order and for good art. Right, <laughs> right. So you think visual structure is the essence of art. Van Gogh couldn't work at all when he was in a mad state. Auguste Valla is never not in that state. His art is always state-bound, as Leo Navratil called it, bound to the patient's state of schizophrenia. The symbols express the patient's illness. It's a language that means something to the patient. In Valla's case, the symbols are Nazis, communists, police, devils, his dead mother. People do buy these patients' artworks. They think it's raw, unmediated expression, which is what people think Van Gogh is, too. August, what's this uh, OVP? With Van Gogh, they're wrong, but with these artists, they're right. This art can't be anything else but heartfelt. <laughs> August Valer is back there in his room, fighting off the darkness, while here, only a few hundred yards away, the asylum turns into a modern art gallery. It's a commercial operation. The work comes out of the special ward, up onto the walls, and away to the homes of collectors, who come here to buy into the myth of mad art. When collectors see an August Valor on the walls here, they see it as something more authentic than knowing Turner Prize type art with its art history cleverness. And in fact, all the art here is totally sincere. But there's no real reason why art should be better it's done out of sincerity rather than calculation. I quite like some of this art, but that's because it reminds me of early modern abstract art from the 1910s by artists like Paul Clay, which was influenced by the look of art by mad people. This is Hans Prinzhorn, another Viennese psychiatric doctor. Here's some of the art of the insane that Prinzhorn started collecting at the beginning of the 20th century. He saw clues there about the nature of the mind. Maybe there's a continuum between sanity and insanity, he thought. It was natural to think like that then, because it was the time of the rise of Freudian ideas. For Freud, it was dreams. For Prinzhorn, it was the art of the insane. Both contained clues about memory and expectation, and how important they are for a safe feeling of reality. Weird symbols are everywhere in this art, but symbols are everywhere in the normal world as well. Come, my love, is the single sentence in this letter from a patient to a husband. And it's repeated and repeated until it becomes a blackness. And on another page, the blackness becomes separate shapes. 
So you're continually faced with radical discontinuity, with nothing fitting in the way that everyone else assumes it ought to fit. There's a lot of play in these systems with ordinary objects unhinged from ordinary meanings. A spoon, a plate, ordinary domestic stuff, and these pictures made entirely out of words. Every single one of these little marks is a word with its own full stop. The thoughts are going everywhere. You can pick out uh, a sentence here and there in German. The second devil stood on the balcony. I heard it. Me too. To be so out of sync with the symbolic world that everybody else appears to inhabit, temporarily might seem nice, but permanently would be horrifying. To be always remaking the world in your own head. Hmm, what's this place? It's the symbolic world, a world of dreams. It looks ordinary, but it's deceptive. Freud called dreams the royal road to the unconscious. Analyze them, he said, and you can find out what are the hidden fantasies that direct our conscious lives. What are our fantasies when we're looking at Van Gogh? We think we know what it was like in his head because we can only ever think of his art through one nutty thing he did, which we fixate on obsessively. Who should really be the patient? Him or us? What did his own madness really mean to Van Gogh? When he was mad, he was really mad, and he couldn't do anything except what he was driven to do by madness. It wasn't to paint, but to freak everybody out around him and frighten them and make them want to have him arrested. The romantic myth of the mad artist, which Van Gogh believed in as much as we do, is a myth that describes a whole set of uh, fantasies as well as realities. The truth of Van Gogh's madness, at least as far as we can make out from putting his life together, which is a very well-documented life because of his letters, which are all models of lucidity and clarity and self-insight. The truth of that madness is that Van Gogh found it not romantic, but tragic and debilitating. This is the hospital in Arles, where Van Gogh was sent after his first really severe mad attack, which came on Christmas Eve, 1888. Van Gogh's illness is likely to have been psychomotor epilepsy. It started affecting him in 1886, but it only became really extreme later on. When he was recuperating from attacks, Van Gogh wasn't mad, and it was only then that he painted. There aren't any spooky voices calling in Van Gogh's paintings. The objects in his paintings are the objects of the ordinary world. They're not irrational objects. He painted what he saw around him in the hospital. In his letters, he described what it felt like immediately after an attack. A carcass, pretty well destroyed. Wits, pretty well crazed. I'm absent-minded, and I couldn't direct my own life now. This is the asylum at San Remy. It's about half an hour's drive from Arles, where Van Gogh eventually had himself admitted. He painted the olive trees here. The convolutions and swirls in those paintings are not symbolic, like the art of the schizophrenics at the Gugging Asylum. It's a realistic type of art. It's a heightened realism, but still based on recognizable reality. It's distorted because it's art, not because it's mad. It's not nearly so distorted as the Kirk Douglas Lust for Life version of the Van Gogh story, which is also the Starry Starry Night pop music version. And they're off, the Van Gogh clichés. They pursued Van Gogh after he died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound in July 1890. As desperate as he appears, as an artist, Van Gogh was much more dignified than his Hollywood myth, and much less mad.